Today, we will talk about the tulip mania. Stay tuned to find out how it influenced the economy, but especially about alternative theories that overshadow what we know happened then. Is it your choice if you want to find similarities between tulip mania and Bitcoin? Don't forget to press the subscribe button, like the video, and share with your friends. The 17th century represented, for the Netherlands, then called the United Provinces, an era of economic prosperity and cultural flourishing, which has gone down in history as the Dutch Golden Age. Despite the wars that took place non-stop throughout Europe, the Netherlands prospered economically and culturally, trade was increasingly intense, and the Dutch made a decisive contribution to the development of many of the modern tools and practices of finance and trade. A fleet of over 10,000 ships sailed across the world's oceans, trading in distant lands and contributing to the country's prosperity and prestige. Art flourished, defining an epoch, brilliantly represented by Rembrandt, Vermeer, Roystal, Halls, and others. Science was booming, driven by scientists such as Anton van Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of the microscope, and Christian Huygens, a brilliant astronomer, physicist, and mathematician. In short, the Netherlands was one of the most evolved, democratic, rich, and respected European countries, remaining so even to this day. In this context, the phenomenon called tulip mania developed, which, starting from a fashion, turned into an economic phenomenon with an unexpected impact on the population. At the end of the 16th century, the repertoire of plants cultivated in the Netherlands was enriched with a new species. The tulip brought, according to the most credible sources, from Turkey. In 1593, Charles de Eliclus, better known as the Latinized Carolus Clusius, one of the most renowned botanists and horticulturists in Europe, became a professor at the prestigious Leiden University and established a famous botanical garden there, whose attractions include he also counted his collection of tulips. The bulbs had been procured from Turkey, through Ogre Giselin de Busbeck, ambassador of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation to the court of Sultan Solomon the Magnificent. Clusius notes that in 1598, thieves stole 100 bulbs in one night. Another botanist, Conrad Gessner, imported tulip bulbs from Constantinople, and in the following years, the noble houses fought for varieties as different as possible from the tulip, obtaining them becoming a high-profit industry. Gradually, the tulip had been requested in other European countries, also for the gardens of the nobles. The tulip has acclimatized so well in the Netherlands that its culture has spread throughout the country and somehow, this flower has reached a sensitive chord in the hearts of the Dutch, becoming their favorite flower and a symbol of social status. It began to be cultivated more and more in gardens and used as a decoration in the elegant interiors of the patricians, even generating the appearance of a special type of pot, called tulip, with several mouths, so that each flower is highlighted in individually. Numerous paintings painted at that time depict, for example, rich bouquets of flowers, among which are tulips, especially those with flowers in several colors, the rarest and most prized. The irony was that there was a phenomenon of tearing of the petals by a pathogen, a plant virus. Infection with this virus slows down the development of plants, so tulips of this type were harder to obtain, rarer, and therefore more expensive than those with single-colored flowers. Called by mosaic botanists, also famous for the multicolored effect it had on the petals and which created special, unique varieties. In 1630, the price of an infested bulb could reach, to today's value, tens of thousands of dollars. In a short time, the whole of the Netherlands was overwhelmed by the frenzy of obtaining tulip bulbs and then sold them on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange at an exorbitant price. In modern terms, $1,000 invested in the bulb business brought in $20,000 a month. Thus, from simple pleasure to amateurism. Gradually, the game took the form of that wild passion that I could see expressed in the paintings of the Dutch masters, as I have already mentioned. The three strata of the Dutch people, initially separated from each other, the aesthetic nobility, the wealthy merchants, and the uncarved peasantry, suddenly united under the banner of the tulip mania, 
which began in 1634 and lasted four years. The estates took care of colors and shapes, the merchants of prices and trade, the peasants of the installation of plantations, and the cultivation of flowers. But they all met at one point, speculation that knew no bounds. This, of course, attracted a lot of cunning and vigilant individuals, who, without having contributed anything to the birth of a mania, or to its course, hoped that through skillful exploitation of the situation, they could achieve important benefits. The main headquarters of this strange activity consisted mainly of the cities of Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam, Alkmaar, Leiden, Harlem, Enquisen, Vianen, Horn and Medenblik. Tulip onions were weighed by the gram, just like cereals or other natural products are sold on the stock exchange. Those eager to buy, but who did not have the capital to invest in tulips, pledged their houses and estates, cattle, tools, clothes, just to get their hands on the much sought after onions. The innocent game of flowers turned into a real madness, to which people gladly sacrificed their last possessions. In 1643, a book with the symptomatic title, De Opkomst en Ondergang van Flora, appeared in Amsterdam, describing the face of nobles, merchants, craftsmen, sailors who had been infected by the same disease. In the early days, when demand outstripped supply, it was easy to win. Anyone who gets rid of onions at high prices would become a rich man. In all the cities, certain pubs, bars, served as special exchanges where these flowers were traded. The contracts were concluded with all the importance and rigor due to significant transactions, so that, after their signing, a great party would unite the buyers and sellers. There were rules and laws, an army of notaries and scribes were in the service of tulip speculation and led a prosperous life. So everyone was trying to get unique bulbs. It is, for example, the famous story of a man who entered a place to eat something, making the big mistake of confusing the precious tulip bulbs with some garlic puppies. Given the value of the famous bulbs, the reaction of the bar owner was one of a kind, managing to send the unlucky man to prison for destroying invaluable goods. Evaluated by specialists, a single bulb of Semper Augustus, best listed on the stock exchange, around $100,000, was the equivalent of four tons of flour, eight tons of rice, a solid wooden bed for two people, for oxen, eight pigs, twelve sheep, a fine cloth suit, two barrels of wine, four tons of beer, two tons of butter, a silver cup and five hundred kilograms of cheese. Looking back, we are talking about an amount beyond the limits of imagination, given the low price of a bulb today. Some prices are known to us exactly from the chronicles of the time. Thus, 400 grams of the Admiral Leafkin species cost 4,400 guilders, 446 grams Admiral Van der Eyck 1620 guilders. Instead, Semper Augustus was more expensive, 200 grams were worth 5,500 guilders, while 410 grams of Viceroy were valued at 3,100 guilders. But the height of the madness was recorded by the scriptures of the city of Alkmaar, in 1637, the city sold, for the benefit of the local orphanage, 120 tulip onions for 90,000 guilders. Compared to their unusual passion for tulips, the people of Harlem were no longer called florists. During the years of speculation, the turnover of a single city exceeded 10 million guilders, with the dishonest stock market also participating, with all the tricks and tricks he would later use in the stock market, in this fantastic action. Thus, in 1634, the tulip mania had reached a development that ruined solid trade. As it was said, it promoted a dirty business, which aroused the greed of the rich and the lusts of the poor. The price of a tulip was higher than its weight in gold. No one predicted that such dizziness would end in wild misery and despair. Thousands of guilders were paid for tulips that no one had seen before, neither the samsar or the seller, much less the buyer. As everyone won, the confidence in the existence of the new wealth grew, and the desire for the new state of affairs to last soon became security. And when people found out that even abroad was overwhelmed by their passion for tulips, as the growing popularity of the tulip attracted the whole nation to this business, all layers of society is involved in growing and trading this flower, they were all trust that henceforth the wealth of the world will flow to the Zuider Zee, and that, soon, poverty will become a mere memory in the Netherlands. How serious this belief was is proved by the prices paid for tulip onions. 
In 1634, partly as a result of demand for tulips from the French side, speculators began to enter the market. In 1636, Dutch traders sold and bought contracts for end-of-season bulbs, implementing a futures market. In the same year, tulips were traded on the stock exchanges of different cities, encouraging the population to support this business. At first, many people got rich, but soon the situation took another turn. People were buying bulbs at higher and higher prices, and they were going to sell them for profit. But this mechanism only worked if someone was willing to pay such a large sum. In February 1637, merchants found that they could not find new buyers to buy the bulbs. The financial catastrophe was announced by the disappearance of trust. It wasn't long before there was room for speculation escape, which was also replaced by panic, just like any economic collapse. The dreams of boundless wealth were gone, and those who, a week earlier, rejoiced to have a few tulips, the sale of which was to bring them a princely fortune, now looked, sad and frightened, at the miserable onions in front, and which, without intrinsic value, could not be sold at any price. Such a thing happens when the price of some goods reaches an exaggeratedly high level, compared with their intrinsic value, the price rises and rises, at the expense of adventurous speculation, some buy a lot, with the idea of reselling more expensively, as we have already stated, and as a result of this high demand, the price increases, until no more buyers are willing or able to offer those prices. When the speculators want to sell the respective goods, a large amount of available merchandise suddenly appears on the market, and the price drops sharply, the bubble breaks, leaving the speculators with big losses. Now the situation was divided into two camps, either they were traders who had contracts to buy tulips at prices ten times higher than normal, or they had bulbs that were worth less than the price paid. Panicked, the people asked for the help of the government, which declared the contracts null and void but only with a tax of 10% of the value. By the end of 1636, however, the Dutch Parliament had already begun to discuss the amendment of the legislation on contracts for the sale purchase of tulip bulbs, and in February 1637, the amendment was voted. Of price fluctuations in the period from the signing of the contract to the term of payment. With the amendment of the law, these futures contracts became what would be called today option contracts. When, at the end of 1636, investors in the bulb business found out about the change that was being prepared, this likely gave a boost to transactions, people were in a hurry to do business with tulips as much as they could, and this would be could lead to higher prices. In this way, the increase in prices would have been the logical, rational response to the changes in contractual obligations, the phenomenon thus being part of what economists call the theory of market efficiency. Changing regulations made such investments risky, therefore, in February 1637, those who had bulbs for sale could no longer find buyers willing to pay the high prices demanded, and at that moment the market collapsed, prices fell sharply. Many of those who had begun to buy bulbs remained, as they say, with them in their arms, now that they were worth much less than the price at which they had been bought, and others, who had not yet paid them, were left with more debts. Greater than the value of the goods. It wasn't good for them, that's clear. Some economists dispute the existence of these bubbles, but others accept that they can occur under certain conditions, consider them a real economic phenomenon, with a relatively well-known mechanism. In any case, they have been studied for a long time, especially since this crisis took place long before. If, however, tulipomania was such a speculative weakness, then it is the first known in history, some economists consider it so, and the next century, 18th, also recorded a few, as there are examples in the 19th century until the most recent bubble. All attempts by speculators to stop change using big words and the most deceptive offers have been unsuccessful. It took many years before the country was able to recover from the blow that her passion for a flower had given her. No one believed that the tulip market would ever collapse. But, as in almost all cases, the speculators gave the coup de grace. The Dutch authorities decided to intervene to regulate the price. Speculators, with antennas in government, suddenly sold their stocks and purchase contracts, flooding the market. In less than six weeks, the price of the tulip plummeted by 90%. Except for the speculators who caused the crisis, everyone lost, some who had agonized over life, 
not being able to pay the debts to the bank or to the contractors. Many Dutch people lost almost all their wealth and, although other similar wraths were present in Europe at the time, only in the Netherlands was the spectrum so wide. Subsequently, the Dutch economy entered a crisis that lasted several years. The entire Dutch economy was ruined because people from all walks of life had entered the tulip business. However, the Netherlands remained the land of tulips, and the delicate flower remained the symbol of the royal house. Based on documents on tulip bulb transactions, some economists argue that price fluctuations were not as huge as we used to believe and were not large enough to cause a speculative bubble to appear. Others argue that in the case of the hyacinth, which, at the beginning of the 19th century, became, for a time, the new favorite flower of the Dutch, replacing the tulip dash, a similar phenomenon occurred, prices were very high at began and subsequently declined, therefore, it would not have been about massive financial speculation, but about a more common phenomenon. The attraction to the new and the gradual decrease of the wave of interest, as the charm of novelty faded and the commodity became more ordinary. A psychological detail, which gives a new meaning to the story, the madness of tulips took place at a time when the Dutch population was facing an epidemic of bubonic plague, not very widespread, but enough to scare the world, which, after the opinion of some researchers, could have led to a more fatalistic attitude and would have stimulated the appearance of more risky behaviors. In this context, many would have been carried away by the wave of speculation with tulips, as if they had thrown themselves into the whirlwind of reckless gambling, letting themselves be caught in the drunkenness of speculation like any other drunkenness with which they would have tried to fall asleep in his fears of death. But not all specialists agree with the interpretation of tulipomania as an economic bubble. In recent years, new theories shed a different light on the phenomenon, explaining it through a different mechanism and denying even its dramatic magnitude and far-reaching tragic consequences. Interpretation as a speculative bubble was generated by the most popular source of information on the story, a book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, written by British journalist Charles McKay and published in 1841, the book deals with various examples of collective teasing based on herd spirit, superstition, belief in false scientific theories, etc. Many editions have been published since then and the book has remained an important source of data until today, in the light of which the phenomenon of tulip mania has been interpreted. The question is, to what extent are these data accurate, how well do they reflect the reality of what happened? McKay, for example, claims that virtually the entire Dutch population was passionate about tulips and that even the poor in the lower classes had interfered in the tulip trade. But despite the popularity of McKay's book, it is no longer seen as a fully credible source of information. Relying on other data and armed with economic theories developed over the past three and a half centuries, many experts believe that McKay's accounts have been exaggerated and that tulip mania would not have been so sensational and with such drastic consequences. What is left, after three centuries and better, of this story, an object of study of great interest to economists, as can be seen, but above all an unquenchable love for flowers and a solid tradition in cultivating and marketing them. The Netherlands is today the largest producer and exporter of flowers in Europe and one of the most important players in the world flower trade market. And culturally, the tulip has remained, until today, in the consciousness of Europeans, the flower of the Netherlands, one of the symbols associated with this country, so much so that it has given it the nickname, the land of tulips.